So I'm just at work right now and I am sorting through old um, school reports from 100 and 150 years back. That's why I have the gloves because there's a lot of dirt on those. And I have found one from 1908 from Frankfurt am Main, which is in Germany. Uh, and this is the school report of the Lessing Gymnasium. And look who is among the one the students that graduated that year. This is Otto Frank, the father of Anne Frank. His chosen um, job or future career was in art history, Kunstgeschichte, which I find is just so, I don't know, this is so charming. This is, this is really just charming. official check-in for my first official uh, reading vlog. I, I, yeah, I'm very excited, also very nervous how this is gonna go, because of course you're seeing the finished product, but I kind of um, still am thinking about how to lead up to these little clips, these little updates. Um, so yeah, this is gonna be just a very quick check-in because I have just come home from work and I'm very exhausted and hungry. So I will make myself some food and read a little bit because afterwards I have to study for my for my last two exams of my bachelor's degree. Super important and really not in the mood for it. So I'm gonna have to, um, I've chosen a really feel good book. You see it now. Um, I've chosen a feel good book to build myself up mentally for that because it's gonna be hard. Yeah, so that's why this is going to be just a very quick check-in. I do want to make a longer check-in to catch you up on the books that I have read so far in September. Um, just as a preview, I have read Chinua Achebe's um, Things Fall Apart, an African classic. I like that. Then I finished David Copperfield by Charles Dickens. I loved that one. Amazing. It was amazing. Ah! Just amazing. And I also finished Circe by Madeline Miller, which I also very much liked. Of course, it's not such a masterpiece as David Copperfield, but what is? Even among Charles Dickens' own works, very few can rival David Copperfield. So yeah, but Circe in its own right was very, very, very good, I thought. And then I read two German books that were on my assigned reading list for, for said exams, called Himmelwärts and Der Keller. Um, you may not have heard about these. They are quite minor publications. I didn't enjoy them as much. Partly, probably, very probably, because they are assigned reading and I tend to dislike my assigned reading, just on principle. I'm gonna do a check-in on them anyway, but feel free to skip them because they are very unlikely to be translated into English ever. Maybe Der Keller um, could be translated into English. That, what I read, was a graphic novel adaptation of the original Der Keller. And it's quite a famous book in German, at least. So it might have been translated into English at some point, but I don't like it in its original form. So I don't recommend it. But yeah, feel free to skip that part if you come across it. And yeah, that's, that's as far as my reading went in September. Right now I am in the middle of Elizabeth von Arnim's Elizabeth and her German garden and I'm loving it. This is a beautiful, first of all, beautiful cover by Coralie Bigfoot-Smith in the Penguin English Library edition. And second of all, the book is so cute. This is a an episodic novel written in letters and spanning one year. And in it, our protagonist, Elizabeth, describes her life um, 
or this one year that she spent in uh, living in the manor house of her fa of her husband's family, which is in Pomerania in Germany, and it's surrounded by this beautiful garden that she comes to care about a lot and that she comes to love a lot, and she describes which plants she had planted in it and the difficulties with the gardeners and stuff like that. Uh, it's just she describes these beautiful feelings that we all know and love, like the smell of wet leaves after after rain and. Those things, you know what I'm talking about. It's just so cute to read about and really transports you out of this not really autumnal but not really summery weather anymore. Out of this status quo weather, I would call it, into a beautiful garden planted with dandelions, like in the cover. This also has a vein of social critique running through it regarding women and women's position in society because um, this is very autobiographical but shouldn't be read as an autobiography which is a mistake many people make. Elizabeth, our protagonist here, she feels stifled in city society but in turn her city acquaintances feel or think rather that she must be shut up in the countryside and how can she bear it and why doesn't she come to 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 the city more often meanwhile she's very happy there she comments on her city acquaintances that they must feel so stifled and shut up in their own lives that the only way for them to bear it is to drown out that silence with with noisiness and with balls and with uh, meetings an unhappy life in essential and meanwhile she is super content with being alone in her garden she doesn't really want anyone visiting her she just wants to be alone she she barely wants the gardeners to be there as well she barely toler tolerates them in her own garden um that's how happy she is living in this garden or in this manor house however because i've just finished reading such a scene that's why i'm mentioning it right now however there is also a vein of smugness and superiority running through this because Elizabeth definitely thinks herself superior to these women who don't even know how how unhappy they are and how happy she is and they want to advise her on being unhappy like them and uh, yeah she feels definitely feels superior to them critique among their her own group is kind of legit however there has just been this scene where she describes how um, Russian peasant families who come to help out for the harvest over the summer, how they treat their wives. And that is, first of all, that alone is quite hard to read about. Second of all, how she feels superior to them because she is able to exert her privilege over her husband. That's really, that leaves a very, very bad aftertaste in my mouth. She feels that they are barely better than animals for that. I just wanted to mention it as something to be aware of while reading this book. But I myself, I'm willing to forget it while reading this because it's otherwise such a charming book. But yeah. These things should not be overlooked, I think, while reading all the literature in in particular. But yeah, so I'm gonna go make that food I was talking about and then I'm gonna sit down and have a good read and... Um, I have 60 pages left, I think I can do that within an hour or two. So yeah, until the next check-in, I should say.
everybody, or as good as a Monday morning can be in any case. Yes, thank you. I haven't filmed anything over the weekend because um, there was nothing to update you about. And I think since this is a monthly vlog, you don't really need to see my kind of empty days or days that I do something totally unrelated to books. And also it's quite a bit of work to put all of that together. So I have skipped this weekend because I have been learning anyway. Today actually there's also not much to update you about reading wise other than still haven't finished Elizabeth and her German garden. Yeah, but that's my that's my own fault. So today I'm gonna go to the library with my sister. Again, thank you for your input, Mile. In the morning he's very chirpy. Very communicative usually. Um, so anyway, we're gonna go to the library, to the university library. Uh, because of Corona, you actually have to have your tickets for your specific seating place printed out if you want to go to the reading room, which we do. We haven't been there since the system came into place, so we're quite excited how that works. You have to have a mask on until you get to your seat, then you can take it off, of course, because studying with a mask on. I'm gonna go pack my things into my library bag because that's another thing that I don't know if it's implemented anywhere else but in Austria in the reading rooms you can't go inside if you have a non-transparent bag um, because there's apparently there's been some theft cases which is sad but yeah so we got ourselves some really nice bags from the National Library which are made out of transparent plastic and that they are kind of the badge of a student. So I'm gonna get ready and get my stuff packed and I will see you guys later. And I hope to show you the reading room because it's it's always reminded me of the Great Hall in Hogwarts. You will see, it's really cute. <laughs> it's really fun there. Hello Chicklet! Hey. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. oh yeah, nice shooting on camera. Do you realize people are watching this? Do you realize that? Yes, you do. <laughs> so angry. He's so angry. Oh yeah, he is.
day, so we've just come home from the library, and, um, well, I've had better learning days, I have to say. It didn't flow very well for me, and, uh, yeah, towards the end there was no sense in staying any longer, so we left a little bit earlier, and um, are now at home. I think my sister is trying to study in her own room a little bit, and I will... Well, I'll make myself something to eat because I'm hungry again and maybe watch a lecture stream or something like that because I don't know if I have the energy to fully review a chapter. <sighs> well, yeah, I'm gonna have to do that tomorrow. What can you do? Um, and yeah, if all else fails, I still have the Iliad. I want to read at least one book today, if not two books. Uh, of the Iliad. So chapters more like. So we'll see how it goes. Why hello and welcome to the promised wrap-up or more like catch-up of all the books that I've read in September so far. Um, yeah, I'm actually not gonna preface this with a whole lot of monologue. If you have skipped or missed my kind of pre-catch-up catch-up, you can go re-watch it. It's in the description box below. The timestamp is. It's a bit earlier in the video, I think. So without much further ado, let's um, let's start, let's say. First thing, as I said, was Things Fall Apart by Ichinua Achebe. Um, this is the whole African trilogy collected into one book. The other parts are called um, No Longer a Tease and Arrow of God. And I know that there are very divergent opinions on which one is the best, which one is kind of the most enjoyable or the most master masterful novel. I've only read Things Fall Apart and I'm not really in a mood to continue right now, which is no fault of this book. Um, but I will get to it eventually. This is the story of our tragic hero, Okonkwa. I have no idea how you're supposed to pronounce Igbo names. I don't even know if that's the right way to pronounce Igbo. Anyways, um, Okonkwo, a tragic hero because he is kind of a very unlikable protagonist and he has some very, very bad qualities, but and we still find ourselves rooting for him somehow. He treats other people badly, but, he, but he's also treated badly himself. And his biggest problem is his tragic fault, as they call it, is his absolutely fragile and unforgiving masculinity that he imposes on himself by kind of, by way of um, overcompensation for the weakling that his father was seen as. He does not want to be seen as a weak man, 
he works his whole life and he works really hard to yeah to get to a status that his father never had his father had a tendency to be kind of lazy laid back artistic um not do more than he was absolutely expected to do and well yeah that was kind of seen as weak but also Okonkwo's father was content with this lifestyle and he did what he was happy doing so in essence he didn't lead a bad life I would say but Okonkwo sees this as a failure as a weakness and he desperately wants to be seen as the polar opposite and that results in him being well yeah he's hardworking. he's a good warrior he is very well respected in those offices in his village but as a human being he's not really not really likable his neighbors don't find him very sympathetic and he is a horrible horrible husband and father he mistreats his children and he beats his wives and what's actually the worst thing about it is he does not does not try to get to know his children as what they really are but he judges them by the standards he imposes on everyone around him and he also doesn't let them see what he really feels even his own family is only allowed to see the picture or the image that he has worked so hard to to build of himself and after toiling for years and after again after gaining all of this status in one Bat of an eyelash, he loses almost everything and he's exiled from his village for several years. And in exile he has an opportunity to kind of reflect on his behaviour, reflect on the things he's done wrong, reflect on the worldviews that maybe are not the best, but he doesn't really take this opportunity and he makes these grand plans for when he, when he comes back how he's going to regain his status and even surpass his status and become one of the leading men in in his village. So with these grand ambitions in his pocket he comes back from exile and he finds the ruins of Igbo society because in the meantime while he's been away English settlers and English missionaries have arrived and at first they were kind of derided by the by the Igbo people they were seen as these fools who have no idea how much they, how much wrong they are doing for themselves, not for others, but for themselves. But they are harmless in essence, or that's what people thought, and they were allowed to do what they wanted. And slowly, imperceptibly, they have gained so much influence over, over certain clan members who were not satisfied or not really happy with the traditional way of life. And it's absolutely torn apart the clan to the point where it's not even able to gain justice for itself when they are mistreated by the English colonists. I'm not going to spoil it any further because that I've already gone far enough. Um, I've basically covered, I don't know, two thirds of the novel because the first half is very episodic. Um, Achebe takes a very, very long time to build up this village before our eyes and built their customs and sketch a very rough structure work of their way of life, their beliefs, their religious beliefs, most importantly, which play a big role in the end. Um, so yeah, in the beginning we are mostly shown just glimpses of life, certain events and certain holidays, and the story part of the story comes quite late in the novel. What I actually like most about this book was the extensive use of proverbs in, in everyday speech and especially um, when the characters would tell a portion of a what is obviously an, a traditional fairy tale and it's made me really curious about what African fairy tales are like because the ones that are retold here I don't know if they are retold in full but they are just so charming my favorite was um, how the turtle got the cracks in its shell that was so beautiful, I, I love that. Um, my edition by Everyman's Library, apart from being really beautiful, look at this, it has this beautiful cover. It's very pretty. And it also includes a very, very good essay, I think, by Chimamanda Negosi Adichie, which
which I thought was very insightful. One of the things that struck me the most was how she observed that, um, especially in parts two and three, uh, Achebe kind of mirrors Greek tragedy structure. So when the novel starts, or when novels start, the kind of tragic event has already happened and we don't see how it happens or how it came to it, but we see the characters grappling with the consequences and um, dealing with the fallout from that event. So, and I thought that was very perceptive, among other things. She is also obviously very, very enthusiastic about Achebe as a writer and about what he means for African literature in an international context, especially. And I just like her writing style in general, which is very calm and very, well, very much like she sounds when she's speaking. I will link the TED talk down below. You should watch it. It's quite legendary. So much for, for this one. First wrap up ready. Finished. Yay! I love this, David Copperfield by Charles Dickens. This was my second um, Charles Dickens experience. I almost said something else. After, after Oliver Twist. Also very, I love these uh, Romance Library editions. They are such beautiful hardbacks and um, they've been updating them and adding kind of these, these picture covers. Before it was just plain white with the cover, with the title on it, but these are beautiful. They are so beautiful. Well, yeah, so anyway, um, that was my, this is my second experience and I will be reading the Pickwick Papers in October through December with a group read. Uh, so yeah, I felt like David Copperfield was kind of similar to Oliver Twist in that we have also have a child protagonist who has fallen socially almost to the bottom and has to kind of fight himself up again. But other than that, they are very different animals. Oliver Twist is, is, was only his second novel and his first kind of serious one, because the Pickwick Papers are apparently just um, a collection of comic episodes, which I'm, I'm looking forward to, but it's, there's not much social critique going on there as opposed to, to Oliver Twist. Um, yeah, Oliver Twist has a lot more satire than comedy and a lot more social critique and, and tragedy, really. You can feel that it was just his second novel, it's an early work for sure, because Oliver Twist as a protagonist kind of ceases to be a protagonist in the second half of the book and um, the plot lines, there are several plots going on in here which kind of flow together, but they are a little bit miscalculated, they don't hit as as much as they are kind of built up to hit, or as I felt they were built up to hit um, in the end. As opposed to David Copperfield, everything about this was just amazing. I, I love this. So in David Copperfield you can see that Dickens had gained an experience of, I think, five more novels in between. This is his middle novel, right? The exact middle child and is supposed to be his own favourite. Um, which I thoroughly believe. It was very carefully planned out and it shows it's um, the plot is perfectly executed, it's paced beautifully um, or almost I think in, in the end there was a little bit of, of, of a slow a miss pacing but it was masterful. Um, this is a Bildungsroman, a typical one, which means that we follow a protagonist throughout their almost their whole life, or for a long stretch of life. And uh, we see kind of their failures in life, their high points in life, and there's not really, there's not really a central antagonist and essential conflict or problem that needs solving and that has kind of um, a final showdown and a final solution. So it ends, I think, in the middle of David's life it begins with this birth and it ends in the middle of his life and everything that happens in between. What I loved most about this was the authorial voice in here, or the narrator's voice in here, which is David himself. He's a first-person narrator and he narrates his own life. 
or kind of comments on his own life. I love this especially in the beginning because for the first 200 pages, this is, this is a chunk by the way, this is almost a thousand pages long. When David is a child, he sounds like a child and that's the criticism that's been leveled at Oliver Twist a lot that Oliver Twist doesn't really sound like a child when he's supposed to be one and Oliver Twist is not a Bildungsroman, it spans I think a couple of months but this one spans really I think several decades. At each point in his life he, he sounds just like a person in that age bracket is supposed to, to sound. Um, my favorite favorite scene was when he gets drunk with his, with his friends and he sounds Oh my god, it's so hilarious, first of all. And he sounds exactly like that like that person who is who's drunk off their mind for the first time and they don't get what is going on. They they don't understand that it's a them losing control over their own body. Someone fell down the stairs and it turns out it was me, something like that. I just love that. It was it was very amazing and also emotionally absolutely devastating and, and upbuilding and and everything. It took me, like, it destroyed me and then built me up completely new. I cried happy tears, I cried sad tears, I cried heartbroken tears, I uh, and I laughed, it was hilarious as well. There's, there's those famous um, character sketches of Dickens is in here. Can you tell that I'm very excited about this book? Oh god, if you liked it, please, please, I don't know, contact me, let's fangirl about this. Or if you didn't like it, tell me why, because I would like to know why. There is, I think, a lot about it not to like, but um, I just, it, it's one of my favorite books of all time. For sure, one of my favorite books this year, and if I hadn't read The Count of Monte Cristo, I think a month back, this would be on the top of the list. No no doubt about it, so absolutely amazing. So next up is Circe by Madeline Miller. Um, I think Madeline Miller must have a thing for Greek myth retellings because she also wrote uh, uh, The Song of Achilles. And there's this kind of short story, Heracles' bow, that's also kind of an Iliad retelling. Um, yeah, this is an Odyssey retelling or a retelling of the portion where Odysseus lands on the island of Aiaia and is imprisoned by, not really imprisoned, but his men are turned into pigs by this witch, Circe, who lives on the island. I had initially planned on doing this in a totally different order. I had planned on, on finishing the Odyssey first, then reading the Song of Achilles, then reading the Odyssey, and only then reading Circe. And as it stands, I have now kind of finished Circe and I am in still, as I, as I said in my book to newbie tag, I'm still in smack in the middle of the Iliad. I hope I said Iliad earlier and not, not Odyssey, I don't remember anymore. Yeah. Yeah, um, why did I do that? Because first of all, well, the biggest reason for me to fast track this was that people were comparing it to the Song of Achilles. I will stop holding up the books now. Um, and in the comparison, Circe kind of lost out. Not that this was a bad book, so the review said, I'm not paraphrasing what the review said. Not that this is a bad book, it's just not as good as the Song of Achilles and also it's kind of quite free in its treatment of the Odyssey whereas The Song of Achilles is pretty much a straight adaptation of the Iliad. And I just wanted to give this a fair chance because I love female viewpoint retellings. Um, the one that I tried before of the Iliad is... Oh god, what was it called? Um, the Silence of the Girls by Pat Barker. That one I didn't enjoy as much because it ended up being yet another retelling of Achilles and 
Well, I'm not gonna spoil it, I don't know. It's not much of a spoiler if you know the myth, but I'm not gonna spoil it. Um, of the myth of Achilles, let's leave it at that. Well, and I kind of wanted a female, or I expected a female perspective retelling. And this is, this gave me it and much more. I loved this. I knew the myth beforehand because I've had three years of Latin in school and we had to read Ovid. And Ovid basically spoils the whole Greek and Roman mythology for you if you know him. <laughs> but he, he's quite good in his own right, he's just a spoily little guy. So I knew the myth, but the thing is the last hundred pages of this kind of 400 page book takes the myth completely off path and, and that I know for some people that didn't work out. For me, it, it worked beautifully. I loved that. I loved not being able to predict what's going to what's gonna happen. And um, I really loved how it forced me to have a new perspective on Cersei as a character, even though I don't remember much of, about her from, from Latin class. I guess I liked her. I mean, she's a witch. She turns men into pigs. What's not to like? Um, I liked her in this one. There were some really nice themes that have started, I've started to notice in the Iliad about the struggle between mortality and immortality. Yeah, I don't want to expand on it too much. I really, really liked this and I very much recommend you read this if you can as, as the first one. This is a year of, of Greek myth and Greek myth retellings. I really like it. to the section that I advised you earlier to skip if you are not interested uh, in German in these German books because I didn't like them they were signed reading I'm really just catching up on them here because I would feel I feel like I would forget I even read them in a few months if it were not for a kind of a visual chronicle of how I read them and how I found them right I had a little bit of an accident with my camera um, battery so well where was I oh yeah right so the assigned readings um, first one was Himmelwert by Elisabeth Klar this is a very new novel from I think January of this of this year must be it's very new and that alone is something that kind of disrecommends a book to me because I don't enjoy I don't enjoy recent literary fiction at all. The youngest books in that genre that I, that I enjoy were from the 80s, I think, and more commonly from, from the turn of the century. This was at least nice enough to keep me reading, I have to say. So, <laughs> the more I think about it, the more positive things I want to find about it. So it wasn't kind of bad, I just didn't enjoy it as much and it didn't work out for me. So the plot of this book is absolutely crazy, I'm going to recap it for you. Obviously if you don't want to be spoiled, in that case skip, of course. Timestamps are below as always. So the plot is, is absolutely crazy. Um, the protagonist is a woman called Sylvia, who is not really a woman at all. She's actually a transformed fox. And the way she became a woman is she stole a human skin suit from a drying line in a garden in Vienna somewhere. And that's how she became a human. I mean, that, that alone is quite crazy. Sylvia kind of likes being human. Even, even the conflicts that arise out of kind of her animal instincts and what she knows would actually be proper human behavior, the conflicts between that are still enjoyable to her. I felt like, maybe I'm, I'm, I've misread it, but I felt like that wasn't a problem for her because she has found kind of the circle that she feels like she fits in. She really fits into a group of drag queens, drag performers and drag enthusiasts who meet in a club called Himmelwärts in Vienna. And in that club she meets a man named Jonathan or Jonathan, <laughs> whichever you prefer. And they kind of have, I don't know, there's some tension between them and she is kind of, she really likes him, or at least her instincts tell her she likes him. 
Um, and they don't have much to do with each other because he leaves for Brazil for work, to work for an NGO in environmental and societal issues. And when he comes back, he's kind of a totally changed person. He's a broken man. He is sad and depressed. He has medical issues, which are, which are a thing of their own. I, I don't want to spoil it. Well, now I don't want to spoil it. Well, his medical issue is that there are tumorous growths in his back, but actually he is growing wings out of his back. I have no idea what to make of that, but, but that's what's happening in this book. And yeah, so only after he comes back with these angel wings growing out of his, out of his back, um, only then does he start to spend more time with Sylvia. She actually takes him in and cares for him as he's getting worse and worse. And um, the rest of the novel really just is about him telling her what exactly went wrong in Brazil. And what went wrong is that he had a relationship with a trans man there and they fell out quite ugly over their differences in coping with, with their work essentially. But the work is something that they care about personally, so they care about environmental issues, they care about um, how horrible the situation of trans people, of queer, pe queer people is in Brazil. And um, they were obviously coping with it very differently. The cataclysm was kind of the murder of another trans friend who was very likely murdered by his family. Jonathan's boyfriend throws himself into really da dangerous work and Jonathan kind of wants to help him cope with it in a little bit more healthy way. Theo is angry at him for not being as angry as he himself is. But the thing is, Jonathan really feels like he's burnt out. He is being so so hurt by the by these issues that he's encountering that, that he's supposed to be solving, um, that he feels like he can't do anything anyway. And what he does is useless and that's how he slowly spirals into into a depression that eventually makes him leave Brazil. That's pretty much what, what this is about. That's pretty much the plot of this book. Um, what didn't work out for me was kind of this mix of magical realism and, and societal critique. The thing that I find kind of that disappoints me a little bit is that while I do care about these issues that are mentioned here, and I think it's a very valid and a very important viewpoint that the author writes from Jonathan's perspective that is being, you know, burnt out by, by his work, his engagement for environmental issues and societal issues. I don't know what it was, but I didn't care. I still gave it three stars because something about the characters, something about the, the theme of this book was interesting enough for me to keep reading. Looking back at, it, back at it, it kind of puzzles me, like good books usually do, in a in a vaguely, vaguely, vaguely pleasant way. So it wasn't actually bad, in case that's the feeling you're getting from this recap. As opposed to this one. This one I really didn't enjoy, I don't recommend it, <laughs> and I, I, I wouldn't go as far as saying I hated it, uh, because it was a short read and it didn't take a lot of my time, but I didn't like it. This is a graphic novel adaptation and the th two things that I didn't like were the writing and the drawing style. So first of all, the writing. Um, this is an adaptation of a prose work by Thomas Bernhard, who is a very famous Austrian author, or was a very famous Austrian author. And this is part two, or like the original, the source material for this is part two of a five-part autobiographical series, I'd say, where he kind of processes his very traumatic childhood and teen years. Sounds like something I should, I should be absolutely excited about, but the thing is, Bernhard's writing style is just, you know, these run-on sentences that go on and on and on. They are not they are basically like three sentences crammed into one. They are very repetitive, they recap and, and, and expand on things that were already said in the previous sentence. And that's just, that's just the writing style that makes me, that exhausts me. 
and that I don't really want to read, I have to be honest. <laughs> if I had read it in original, I probably would have DNF'd it. But that's not a fault of this book. The fault of this book is the drawing style, and you can see on the cover, it looks like a semi-talented teenager drew this with a ruler and a little bit of freehand writing. There are no speech bubbles in here, the text or kind of the I don't know what it's called, I don't know the terminology, I don't read graphic novels, but kind of the picture box is not broken up by by any kind of speech bubbles or anything whatsoever. It looks throughout like this. So the picture on the bottom and a box of text running on top of it and that's it. I found that very tedious to read and after a while I just ditched the pictures and just read the text. I don't recommend this, I don't like this. And now before my battery dies on me yet again, I finished, I finally managed to finish Elizabeth and her German garden last night, this morning actually, and the latter half is quite a bit different than the first half. The first half is very much about the garden and the latter half is very much about um, about social issues that I already started talking about in the recap. Again, if you've missed that, skip or like rewind ahead. Elizabeth, the protagonist here, has two friends or two acquaintances over over Christmas. Not much to say about a garden in winter time, so there's more of the societal stuff. Yeah, I don't know if I like that. Oh, no, I did like it, sorry. I did like it, but the thing was, there was a part that was very hard to read a monologue of her husband about the inferiority of women that was meant to draw, to like satirize him, to paint, to throw a bad light on him as a character or as you know, Elizabeth von Arnim's actual husband, who he is meant to like caricature. Uh, but the thing is, it was still very hurtful to read for me personally. So kind of, that kind of took a notch out of my, of my enthusiasm for this novel, which is a bit sad, but I think overall, this is a really good book. I recommend reading it, and if you want something um, similar, also an autobiographical account. The Turkish um, Embassy Letters by Mary Wortley Montagu, which are kind of an early 18th century letter collection, where she travelled with her husband to Constantinople, he was ambassador there. I very much recommend this, I really like this, and it reminded me of Elizabeth and her German garden. This is more about politics and, and culture and cultural differences, whereas this one is about social standing and finding one's own happy place in the world and being content with one's life, I guess. Welcome into the Austrian autumn. The weather broke overnight as you can see and it's now officially autumn and well I don't want to say I wasn't looking forward to this but I was kind of I was expecting something along the lines of you know 15 degrees and sunny weather kind of the golden autumn yeah, the reality is more like 15 degrees and raining cats and dogs. And I don't know why I'm getting my hopes up every year, because this happens every year and this is how it's going to look like outside from now until until April or May. And it has been for the last 23 years. I, don't, I have no idea why I'm always getting my hopes up. I like the idea of autumn more than I actually like the reality of autumn. That's kind of, that's my problem. In any case, um, reading wise, the last couple of days have been kind of barren because I've had to study a lot and my whole last week and my whole next week have looked, or will be looking like, like this.
who who wants to be studying when they would rather read books, right? Nobody. Nobody. That's the reality of it, sadly. I have a very important exam on the 2nd and then again on the 8th. So I won't be filming much more for this for this reading vlog because I have to study a lot and as I have discovered, editing a reading vlog is not as easy as it sounds. Not, not such a breeze as I had expected. It's fun, but it takes a lot of time. So I will probably be closing this one of these days, if not today, we shall see. Probably after today, because I will be finishing one more book before the end of, of September. Um, it's not going to be the Iliad, because I still have 200 pages left on that, and it's the Iliad is not, not the fastest book for me to read. The past, I don't know, four books have been, I'm now on book 16 out of 24, and the past four books have been just fighting just fighting and it was just, you know, a swaying of battle luck in one book the Achaeans were winning, then in the other book the Trojans are winning uh, many people are dying, I have forgotten half of the names my kind of rule of thumb is if the name hasn't been mentioned more than three times I, I don't even care to remember, I don't bother to remember um, luckily there's an index of names at the back. So it's been kind of tedious. I mean, it was it was good, it was epic. It's just, you know, reading 200 pages of battle. I'm kind of, I'm, I'm getting out of breath here, so... Yeah, the next book is titled... And I will give you an opportunity to mute this if you don't know the myth, or if you are planning on reading Song of Achilles first by Madeline Miller. If you know the myth, this is not going to be new for you, I just want to, you know, it's not much of a spoiler if it's 2000 years old, but hey. So, mute now. Um, the next book is titled Patroclus Fights and Dies, and I don't know if I'm ready for that. I mean, it's, it's going to be a little bit of a fresh breath after all of this fighting, um, because after Patroclus' death, um, Achilles kind of gets back into the game and it's gonna be a lot of psychology in there, I know. So I'm kind of excited for that. But I don't know if I'm ready for the emotional devastation. I don't know if I'm ready for that. Yeah. So, um, I have 200 pages left and uh, I don't think I'm gonna be able to finish it in five days. What I will be able to finish, I think today or tomorrow even, is the third part of the Reckless series. This is The Golden Yarn. And this doesn't get much airtime on English-speaking booktube, I feel. In general, this author doesn't get much airtime, which should absolutely change. Please, people, go read her! Cornelia Funke is a German children's classics author. She has written so many classic children's books. I don't... I have no idea how many. I think six or seven series come into my mind that really have been iconic during my childhood. Everybody knew what they were talking about when her name kind of fell. Um, I mentioned her Inkworld series in my booktube newbie tag as the book that got me into reading, that influenced me a lot and that influenced me actually to study literature myself. This one is a bit different. It's similar to Ink World, but it's a bit different. So this is a dark, or not, yeah, it's a semi-dark retelling of the classic grim fairy tales. And by semi-dark, I mean a couple of really, you know, it's a bit heavy sometimes, but in general, it's really pretty. But I guess the overall atmosphere of this is a little bit too heavy for me to recommend it to children or young teens, but I read it as a 15-year-old and I found it very impressive, so don't let yourself be told what to read if you want to read something. Um, the protagonists in here are John, sorry, not John, that's her father, Will and Jacob Reckless, which are meant to be kind of the personifications of the Grimm brothers historical ones. Um, Jacob, so the fa their father, first of all, 
their father disappeared when they were children. He either left the family or disappeared, nobody knows where to. And they've been living with their mother. When he's 12 years old, um, Jacob Breckless discovers a huge mirror in the study of his father and a kind of secret message that tells him to go through the mirror. And he enters into the mirror and enters into this alternative fairy tale world that's kind of very similar to, to the real world, so the ge geography and, um, and the history. If you know a little bit of, of European history, you will immediately recognize what, what is what in here, but um, it's a little bit different. So the major difference is that magic still exists in that world and it's populated with mythical creatures and fairy tale creatures and most importantly artifacts out of these fairy tales. So the glass slipper of Cinderella and uh, the tablecloth that, that produces a, a feast whenever it's laid out. All of these things exist in here and they are hunted down and looked for by treasure hunters. And Will, oh, sorry, Jacob, and Jacob joins kind of, not the guild because they are not organized, but he enters into an apprenticeship with a treasure hunter and becomes a very famous treasure hunter in his own right over the years. But when they are in their mid kind of 20s, Will also discovers the mirror and he enters through it and he is attacked and injured by a goyle who is a kind of stone creature. So he he is vaguely human-like but his skin and flesh are made out of precious stone. And because of a curse that's recently been kind of enacted on these injuries caused by goyles, Will is slowly starting to turn into one. And what's more, his, uh, his skin or the stone he is turning into is jade, which is a sort of holy stone for the goyles. Um, yeah, so now Jacob is racing to find an artifact or a kind of cure for this curse and the Goyle are also racing to find Will because there's been a prophecy about the Jade Goyle and, you know, all of that stuff. So yeah, that's kind of the premise of the first book. Um, what I love about this, two things, first of all, this is not just a simple treasure hunt adventure story. This has a lot of politics in it because the Goyle, who have been up until then a sort of hunted people, they were they were you know hunted and and killed and exhibited like animals. They have been united under a king, Camien, which is very unusual, and they have been conquering the equivalent of Europe in the mirror world. And there are a lot of high politics in this book, a lot of people who have many stakes going on in the war. So yeah, but there's still a lot of magic, there a lot of magic involved in the politics. The second w reason why I love this so much is because each book kind of focuses on a different geographical tradition of fairy tales. The first one was the classic German Grimm's fairy tales that probably many people know from their childhood. The second book played in in Lothringia, which is supposed to be France, so there were French fairy tales. The third book, this one, is taking place in Varangia, which is Russia, so Russian fairy tales and Asian fairy tales, and the fourth book, which will be coming out on November 2nd, and I have actually pre-ordered this, which I never ever do with books. The fourth book will be taking place in Nihon, so Japan, and we will be finding out about Japanese fairy tales, which I'm very excited for. I hope the fifth book is going to be taking place in Africa, because I'm, I'm very... I love African fairy tales, as you will know from my recap from reading Things Fall Apart by Chino Achebe skip ahead in this video if you have skipped that because I talk about that extensively. So yeah, I'm 200 pages in. Um, I still have 200 pages to go. I will be finishing it today because it's so quick to, to, to read as opposed to the Iliad. 
So I will still promptly be giving an update on this. Um, spoiler warning ahead, I guess, because these books really do build a lot on top of each other. You can't just jump into a third part and expect to, to know what's going on. There's a lot of um, baggage from the, from the previous two books. Uh, so, yeah. I'm, I'm excited to be finishing this. And we will see each other in a bit, I guess. We again interrupt our regular broadcast to say a big, big thank you to Sam from Griff Reads who recommended to me this amazing video editing program called Da Vinci Resolve, which does have quite a steep learning curve to it, but she was so kind as to attach a complete beginner's tutorial video. And um, going back and forth between the video and the program, I think I learned all the basics. And it really does have everything you might need and much more than that. It certainly covers all of my needs. So yeah, I think I'm pretty fluent with it now, so I'm gonna... I'm going to be exclusively editing with this and the next video will be edited with this as well. And Sam, thank you so much. You have no idea how many nerves and how much time you have spared me. Thank you so much. All right, hello and welcome to my last official... There's no non-official check-in, but to my last check-in. Um, I'm gonna be keeping this brief because, as you have seen, I have already started editing the vlog and we are over an, over an hour already. And that's kind of, that's already cut as much as I can cut it, or want to cut it. So, yeah. This is gonna be very brief. Luckily, I don't have many conflicting emotions about this, because the Golden Yarn really disappointed me. The thing was, there is barely any plot to this. So it starts out by, of course, a, con a conflict being introduced, and I'm going to take off my glasses, and, well, suddenly the characters are kind of chasing after each other, not really sure what they are chasing after, but they are chasing after it, and the showdown, if it indeed can be called a showdown, happens in three pages, then it's over, the characters leave, then the other characters that have been chasing after the first set of characters arrive, everything is over, they see they cannot do anything, and they start deciding what they're gonna do next, and that's where the book ends. Everyone is chasing after everyone here, never kind of even getting close to them, not many plot twists in here, I mean, this is kind of a treasure hunt story by definition, because Jacob Reckless is a treasure hunter, so even in the first two books, it was all about, you know, the race to get this one important artifact. I mean, it was pretty simple in the sense that they were chasing after one thing, but um, at least there were some interesting complications in between. This one doesn't have that. It's literally just one continue, almost one continuous journey with a little bit of an intermezzo in between. The second thing was the fairy tale portion of this was very, very meager. I was looking forward to reading more Eastern fairy tales or retold fairy tales in here because I'm from the East myself. I'm from Slovakia and our fairy tales are very much like Russian fairy tales and we have some kind of common figures in there. But it felt like Funke had a list of of Russian or Asian fairy tales and she was just, you know, checking the boxes, the creatures and the artifacts that she's, she's already mentioned. And that was it. There wasn't much of a deeper sense behind it. But the most disappointing thing, the one that I cannot forgive this book, is the romance portion. This was so extremely disappointing and flat. I cannot begin to describe it. So. It's been clear from book one that Jacob and Fox are meant to end up with each other in one way or another. Throughout book one and two they have been kind of disguising their feelings for each other, even from themselves. In the middle of book two something happened that kind of complicated a possible love affair between them. Here it was quite obvious that in book three they will be acknowledging their feelings for each other. It happened, it happened, I have to I have to say as much. It happened, but it happened really in a way that made Jacob seem in my eyes like a howling, jealous infant. And 
fox like a woman that's been that's given up something that should be very good for her in order to save Jacob from himself yet again. I always thought that they were kind of on, you know, on eye level, seeing eye to eye in the romance department, but I feel like Celeste has given up a lot of herself and a lot of her opportunities and sacrificed her own happiness, or at least temporary happiness, to be with Jacob. That takes the illusion off of everything, I feel. One thing that was really funny in here, though, is that there is one artifact that's kind of mentioned in passing, which is a book with a silver cover, and everyone who opens that book and reads in it will be able to call forth things and people and characters from other books that they read aloud. And that was such a charming reference to the Ink World series. I loved that. It was really cute. I am half afraid and half excited what the fourth book is gonna do with this story. I was really looking forward to that romantic moment between Fox and, and Jacob though, so I don't know. I, there's not much to be looking forward to for me personally. In other news, I will be sharing my October TBR which will not be very long because I'm a terrible, terrible mood reader and every list that I have ever prepared of stuff I will be reading has kind of gone to the fish pretty quickly. But there are a couple of things that I will be reading this month, for sure, or next month. This month in your time, next month in my time. Let me show you real quick because we don't want to go over an hour or well over an hour here. All right, so... First things first, I will be finishing the Iliad, which I can't hold up for you to see now, although you've seen it already because it serves as my camera stand right now. We are standing on the shoulders of giants today with the Iliad and the DVD collection of the Hollow Crown, which uh, any Shakespeare fans should be keeping in mind. Because on the 16th of October I plan on doing another video, and this one focused on Shakespeare's histories. I've already mentioned this as well, The Pickwick Papers by Charles Dickens. This is quite a chunk of a book. This is, I think, 800 pages long. Yep, 800 pages. And I will be reading it not just in October, but throughout, until the end of the year. I'm quite excited for this because this is Charles Dickens's first novel, the one that kind of was the breakthrough bestseller for him and that established his name as a, an author to be watched. Next up, some books that have been lent to me. First of all, A Gentleman in Moscow. I have no idea what this is about. It was lent to me on the basis that the writing is supposed to be really beautiful in this, so I am excited for that. I always love beautiful writing. Zodiac and Mindhunter is, has been lent to me as well. Um, I don't need to say on what basis I like true crime, <laughs> the person who lent it to me likes true crime too. I hope to finish this before the end of October so I can kind of get together and fangirl with the person who lent it to me. Thank you so much. And last but not least, I think the, like, the cold season would be ideal to read this. This is 1984 by George Orwell and the cover is censored in this edition. I hope to be reading this this October or at least this fall sometime this year because I feel like, I don't know, totalitarian dystopias should be read in autumn, shouldn't they? I feel like they should. And elections are coming up as well, so... There are a couple of other things that I would like to read. For one, The Song of Achilles and Conversations Conversations with Friends by Sally Rooney. Uh, but the thing is, I have them lent from the library and Song of Achilles is already overdue and Conversations with Friends will be overdue in a week or in a couple of days. So I won't be able to finish them because until I order them and I actually get them again, it will be November, probably December. So yeah, it's gonna be a winter read for me. Um, but I think this is already quite a lot, isn't it? And probably I'm not going to finish all of them. I'm, I would be very surprised if I did. You will be updated whenever I do. Um, yeah, so I will see you on the 16th. And I hope you have a nice, nice week. Nice, nice month. And I hope that autumn is really nice where you are at.
or spring, wherever you are in the world. I don't know, um, let me know. Thank you for watching and bye, until next time. Mm.